I sometimes get asked if I had to choose between the moon and Mars, which one would I pick? And hands down, I would pick the moon. Um, it happens to be more treacherous than Mars, but one, you can get to it very quickly, maybe two, three days, as opposed to six months, one-way trip to Mars. And that, my dear friends, is the reason I would pick the moon. If I find the right spot, I can see the Earth float by every, every day. An Earth rise and an Earth set. And that is our home. It's a beautiful picture from one of our lunar orbiters. That happens to be one of my favorite photographs from the Apollo missions. And what you see here, he looks like a coal miner, but he actually is an astronaut who just went out on a long sortie on the lunar surface, um, a walkabout of sorts in a spacesuit. And that's what you look like when you come back into your habitat with all the lunar dust that has stuck onto your suit and you take off your helmet and your suit. So this is how tough the lunar terrain is going to be as and when we choose to create a permanent human outpost. On Earth, we take a lot for granted gravity, atmospheric pressure, even natural illumination and the gamut of colors that it brings to us. If you look at the Apollo photographs, a lot of them look more or less black and white and gray. And life is going to be black and white and gray on the moon. And because we have no atmosphere, no running water, the lunar dust is extremely fine and very sharp like glass. Unlike the sand that you see here on the beaches, which has been rounded off by the weathering forces. So this dust sticks onto the creases of your spacesuit. It gets into the mechanical parts of your moon buggy. It gets into everything. And if you happen to bring it back in, you will breathe it in. It'll go sit in your lungs. And apparently, it smells like burnt gunpowder. So we as designers, as space architects, we are working on ideas for suit boats, where you actually go for a walkabout on another planet, but when you come back in, you leave the suit outside of your habitat or your rover, and you wiggle back into the, from the back door of your suit, leaving the suit outside. I grew up in Ahmedabad. Um, and growing up, I had this bicycle and uh, a portable German typewriter, which I had inherited from my dad. And for those of you who are familiar with Ahmedabad, it has all these amazing institutes. And when I was back in school, we didn't have cars pretty much. So I could bicycle to all these fantastic places, School of Architecture, National Institute of Design, IAM Ahmedabad, which is Indian Institute of Management, Space Application Center. And those were the days we didn't have internet, guys. It was a completely different world. So, when I was in high school, I started working on these imaginary problems of living and working in microgravity. And my best companions were these libraries, and I would seek out interesting people to go meet, talk about my ideas. And every design concept I came up with to solve a certain problem which I had in my head, I would also try and send it out to space agencies or universities. And if you're wondering how I did that without the internet, I would often use imaginary addresses, which were near OK. So if I were writing to Bill Gates, I would say, Bill Gates, CEO, Microsoft, Seattle, Washington, USA. And you know, for every 10 letters that I would write with these design ideas, I would get a response to two or three, which was pretty good for those days. In 1995, so what I did is I did a bachelor's in engineering. By then, I was pretty sure I wanted to be a zero-G designer. I went in for my master's in industrial design at NID in Ahmedabad. And then I wanted to go to France to study at the Space University. And I had to raise around $35,000 in eight months to be able to attend the Space University. So what do I do? Where do I find the money? I, I, re I reached out to nearly 70 foundations. I got a list from, a, from an uncle of mine who worked in income tax all places. <laughs> I, 70 foundations, guys. I wrote to the United Nations in nine different ways. You can corner anyone, and why leave the UN? I wrote to five different individuals, Carl Sagan, Bill Gates, Arthur Clarke, and a couple of others. And one afternoon, 
I was having this afternoon nap on a chatai on the floor. I love, I'm a floor person. I was sleeping. And I get this call from Colombo. And guess who's called? Arthur Clarke himself. And he asked me, so Susmita, how much do you need to get to the Space University? And I was kind of half asleep, half awake. So I, I sort of blurted out a number. I think it was around $4,000 or something like that. The next day, I sent him a fax. We used to use fax those days. And I said, um, sorry, I said something, but I don't exactly know, because I didn't know how much to ask of him. So he called the university the next day, and he essentially said, just let me know, and I'll have it transferred. So what I'm trying to tell you guys here is, I know you guys are the empowered generation, you know, apps and internet and whatnot, but I think the idea here is to reach out to anyone in the world who you think you want to have a conversation with or you want to share your ideas with. And it's amazing how responsive some of these super busy people are. They are the, usually the ones to respond the fastest. What you see here is a um, scene from the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, which Clark and Kubrick created in the 60s, and it's a classic. So this is what we grew up on Star Trek and 2001, and this is where I landed after the Space University at NASA Johnson in Houston. Well, this is a shot from the International Space Station. But when I arrived at NASA in the late 90s, I was a little shocked because everything looked quite outdated and obsolete. And the reason is traditional government agencies tend to design everything with an engineering-centric approach, where they don't bring in architects, designers, and others in a very integrated fashion. And this is what we end up with. This is the destiny module on the International Space Station, which is right now orbiting around us at around 400 kilometers from the Earth. And by the way, all of us here in the room are also orbiting this very moment. We are on this blue ship that we live on, and we are traveling at almost 67,000 miles an hour right this very moment, but we forget about it. When, when you see this, if you are an engineer and a designer, you wonder why after 40 years of human spaceflight or 30 years of human spaceflight are we living in things like this? So in 2004, me and um, a few of my friends, there aren't that many space architects anyways. Uh, it's not a great profession where you can make a lot of money. It's, it's something you thrive on passion here. So what we did is we published a book. It's called The Silver Book in, in the, space, the World of Space Architecture. So the book is based on the premise that spa space architecture comes in three genres. The first genre is the, the architecture that we see in science fiction books and films. The second genre is what you see what the government agencies design. And the third genre is just starting to happen, where we don't draw a line between Earth and space, where we take a multidisciplinary approach to design. And the idea is to bring together all these disciplines and try to create something which is more human-centric, which is not just survivable, but habitable, because we're going to live out there for months at a time. So I moved back to India. In 2004, I started my, well, let's say I started with Boeing and NASA in the late 90s. And I get bored very easily. So I, I left and I moved to San Francisco. That's where I started my first company in 2001, a small company called Moonfront. In 2004, I started my second company in Vienna called Liquifer. And I moved back to India in 2008. And my third venture is called Earth to Orbit. What I tell youngsters in Bangalore, we have a few st space startups now in Bangalore, in India. What I tell them is, if you want to be a space entrepreneur, you have to think very differently than an IT entrepreneur. You have to have balls. You have to be in it for the long haul. You have to design things, build things, and fly things. And it takes a good six to seven years to say, I have arrived. The first few years are super tough when you kind of work on concepts and stuff, and then you start establishing credibility and you, you get bigger projects. So I'm going to show you a video, a prototype of a habitat which can collapse. It has four petals, and two of the petals are crew quarters for two astronauts. 
The other two, one is a workstation, the other one is your life support and hygiene facilities. So what you're seeing in the picture is a time-lapse video of this prototype, which this was the first rehearsal after outfitting the whole habitat. We, we kind of brought it back to a stored configuration. So this is the configuration you would launch habitats on rockets, for example. Uh, it's also the kind of configuration which would work. You fit it on a lorry and take it from one city to the next. And this is not designed to be used in space, but here on Earth as a simulator. So you lock in two people for a duration of maybe two weeks with all the consumables, the tools, all the protocols and procedures, and they have to live in there and do what they have to do without any external help. So that's one of the prototypes that we recently built. And typically a project like that takes anywhere around three years. And we always work as a consortium. So there are a couple of companies, a couple of universities, a couple of uh, research organizations that come together. So my company, the role we played was we did the uh, overall architectural design, the systems engineering, and we outfitted the habitat. So it's a very fairly involved role for this one. What you see here, guys, is one of our recent concepts that won a prize in one of the 3D printed habitat design challenges that NASA had organized. Uh, this was done by my Vienna company in collaboration with the European Astronaut Center. And right here in the audience, I met this young kid called Alok, who's working on a 3D printer. He told me they want to print UAVs. I mean, so 3D printers, as we all know, is going to revolutionize the way we build things. We already print our models in our studio with 3D printing. But this is the future, guys. For a long time, the idea of constructing extended habitats on other planetary surfaces um, has been a challenging, even conceptually challenging. And so what we're seeing here, front is the main habitat, which is an inflatable habitat with a repurposed shell from the descent and landing module. And the rest of the uh, pods that you're seeing are essentially made by the rover that uses Martian terrain and 3D printing construction techniques combining both sintering and what we are calling lava casting to create these other tubes, other pods, and we connect them via tunnels and airlocks. So this is the future we're looking at. This is, um, again, a rendering from one of my other projects where we had to design a pressurized rover, a bubble of sorts, where you can transport a crew of four astronauts on long-distance uh, sorties on Mars. Uh, the good news, guys, is that the space is opening up to private enterprise. People like me, and there are others out there, uh, we are quite happy to see that space will not be controlled only by governments and space agencies um, in the future, but we'll have a role to play as well. And what happened to commercial aviation in the last century is going to happen to space travel in this century. In the last 50-odd years, only maybe 500-odd people have gone to space, but that's going to change. And I think the other big thing that we space architects sometimes talk about is if you look at the accelerated place, sp pace of climate change, and if you look at the amount of trash we create, um, I mean, if all of us are ordering food on apps and it all ends up in plastic trays every day, in maybe three or four generations from now, we'll be trashing the Earth. I mean, the Earth won't be habitable anymore. And if that happens, then instead of a blue spaceship, our great-great-grandkids would probably be living on a red one. I think with that note, I'll end it here. Thank you very much.